Okay, hello. Um, good afternoon, if you're in Britain uh, or Europe. Uh, good morning, if you're in Latin America. Welcome to Panning House and our conversation today about Mercosur, trade alliances, uh, a thorough look at Mercosur, its uh, usefulness, uh, its tensions, uh, where it goes from here, how it will develop in the years ahead. My name is Jeremy Brown. I'm the Chief Executive of Canning House, uh, and we're delighted to host today's conversation uh, in conjunction with GPS and with the Paddy Ashdown Foundation. And I should say, just as a personal note, because I was, um, I was for 10 years a member of the British Parliament, and I was a Liberal Democrat MP. So Paddy Ashdown was the leader of my party, and I knew him very well, and I remember how shocked I felt and still feel when he died quite rapidly four years ago, just over four years ago. So um, an opportunity for us at Canning House to do something in conjunction with the Paddy Ashdown Foundation uh, is a great coming together of two elements of my life, which uh, both of which have uh, been a source of interest to me. Right, enough of that. We've got four um, panellists who know all there is to know about Mercosur and are going to uh, inform and entertain us. Um, we've got an hour and a half available for the conversation, uh, but I'll probably aim to make it an hour and a quarter because in these daytime events, I think bringing things on, on time and being respectful of people's time uh, is a good way to do it. So um, we're gonna go through and each panelist, uh, I will introduce them and they can set out their state of their stall, how they see things in Mercosur. Uh, and then uh, I hope and believe that will lead on to a natural conversation and we can um, probe some of the tensions and points of interest and opportunities that exist in the blog. So, first of all, Emily Rees, who is the founder and managing director of Trade Strategies. Just let me uh, allow you to place Emily briefly. Emily is an international trade policy expert and founder, as I say, of Trade Strategies, a trade and regulatory consultancy. She comes from an extensive career in EU affairs, trade policy and economic diplomacy, having led Brazil's trade and investment agency relations with the EU and served as deputy trade attache of France to Brazil. She is a senior fellow at the European Centre for International Political Economy, where she leads the EU Mercosur project. So perfect person to get us started. Emily, over to you. Thank you, Jeremy. And uh, first, allow me to congratulate uh, Canning House, uh, the team at Canning House, for the excellent policy briefing on the future of Mercosur, which I invite everyone here on the line uh, to take a look at. Um, it really cleverly sets the scene um, of uh, the strategic juncture um, the customs union finds itself uh, now uh, as we start 2023. Now, please bear with me uh, slightly today as I am quite jet lagged coming back from Brasilia yesterday. Um, but I was so fortunate to be there um, to meet with uh, ministry officials, the diplomatic community, business representatives to really garner a, a, a holistic view of what we can expect now from Brazil and how that works also in the framework of Mercosur. And despite the many challenges ahead, I must say that I remain optimistic for the region um, as a whole. Accompanying the first days of the Lula Alckmin administration, I felt a great sense of duty, purpose, uh, pragmatism actually from all uh, those that I had the chance to encounter there. And uh, since Lula was last in power and allow me to set, uh, set the scene here a bit for our conversation today, the world has changed significantly. I was posted, you mentioned, uh, to Brazil uh, many years ago. Um, at the time, uh, Lula was president, but how the world has changed since. The rise of China has given way to a multipolar world with trade frictions uh, largely on the rise. We also now have a climate crisis, which is upon us, and we're urged to act with, with a sense of urgency, I really would say, to confront these polysystemic uh, challenges. Now, 
The question is, how does Mercosur navigate within this accelerated shift in paradigms? Um, we, we also see, and I'm sure Paolo uh, will, will be well aware that, you know, um, as the, the US and EU are going to start embarking on a, a bit of an industrial subsidies race, there's a risk for Mercosur of not being able to catch up, uh, being also caught in a web of, of unfair competition. And that's why Mercosur needs to be strengthened, in my view, more than ever. So uh, on a more positive note, uh, the recent rapprochement uh, between Argentina and Brazil that occurred earlier this week seems to be more than symbolic. There's now a political impetus uh, to eliminate some of the outstanding trade barriers between Mercosur countries, also provide, I would say, uh, impulse to achieve regulatory co convergence, coherence, uh, conclude the trade facilitation protocol, and finally ensure the ratification of the EU Mercosur trade deal. Earlier on Monday, I was in Brasilia uh, on the occasion of a very special vi visit. The European Commission's Executive Vice President, Franz Timmermans, traveled to Brazil, uh, sending a very clear message to the region that the EU is ready to move forward um, uh, on the ratification <laughs> path of the association agreement. To get there, though, there's still a bit of work to be done, um, not least uh, the finalization of the uh, climate and environment side instrument. I'm sure Paolo has a, a much more authoritative uh, wording for that. Uh, but the EU wants to see results on deforestation, as many parts of the world do. And Brazil has some qualms of its own, which we'll be looking at as well, not least with respect to uh, the more recent uh, European uh, autonomous or unilateral instruments uh, that could end up hindering competitiveness. And, and these are instruments such as the carbon border adjustment mechanism that is still yet to enter into force. So uh, just allow me to reiterate my, my great pleasure on being on such a distinguished panel today. And I'm really looking forward to learning a lot with this conversation. Emily, thank you very much, and I um, anticipate that the EU Mercosur deal, or um, deal that isn't, but maybe will be a dominant theme of our conversation, so we'll come back to that. Right, our next panellist, Federico Lavopa, Director of International Trade at Kipu. Let me introduce you briefly, Federico. Federico is partner and leads the international trade practice at Kipu a strategic advisory firm specialized in trade and investment, public affairs and sustainable development in Latin America. Prior to joining Kipu, he developed an extensive career in the public sector of Argentina, having held various positions related to international economic affairs. Most recently, he served as Under Secretary of Foreign Trade and head of the Foreign Trade Policy and Negotiations Division. So Federico, you're perfectly placed to talk about this subject and particularly to give us the Argentinian perspective. And it'd be great for you to hear your introductory remarks. Uh, thank you very much, Jeremy, and thanks Canning House and GPS for the opportunity to be here with you. Uh, my intention is just to present some points on how, where do we stand in Mercosur now, and maybe pose a question of where can we go from there. Uh, my first point would be, and I think it's not surprising for any of you, especially if you have read the excellent paper by Cunninghouse, Mercosur has not delivered. Uh, it has not met the original goals that the creators of Mercosur had thought. Uh, Mercosur was supposed to create a common market, a customs union by 1994, 1995 at, at most, and 30 years later, we don't have a complete internal market. We don't have complete free circulation of goods. We only have partially a common external tariff. And I would also say that to an extent, Mercosur also failed uh, to meet the expectations of becoming a platform for the integration of Mercosur members in the world economy. Uh, my second point would be that Mercosur is in a gridlock uh, uh, and it has been there for a lot of time. Uh, Mercosur works in a sort of sporadic dynamic. We have short periods of a lot of activity, a lot of progress, and then, unfortunately, we have long periods of almost paralysis. Uh, we can talk more about this later, but I think that this is mostly the result of uh, a decision-making rule based on consensus, which means that any member can block any decision at any time. So that means that you have to have uh, alignment of 
the four political, ideological alignment of the four members, if you got, if you want to move move ahead, uh, especially of Brazil and, Ar and Argentina, and this is very rare. Uh, and it's also a result of its political economy. I would say that nowadays you don't have one Mercosur in terms of interest group. You have one Mercosur, which is the agro-industrial sector, the food exporters, which are increasingly pushing for trade liberalization, for open markets, for free trade agreements. And then you have another Mercosur, which is more industrial-based sector, which is less competitive and is constantly pushing to keep a high protection in Mercosur. Uh, as you can imagine, this causes a lot of frustration in some of Mercosur members, especially when they see that Mercosur is losing relevance. It's losing relevance for its member states. It's also losing relevance for the world. Uh, Mercosur in the late 90s represented roughly 22% of interest rate uh, in the region. Now it represents uh, more or less 12%. Uh, Mercosur in 1995 was around 4.4 of world GDP, and nowadays it only represents 3.3 of world GDP. Uh, so this causes frustration among some of its members. Uh, for the first time of Mercosur history, uh, two, two of its members, Brazil and Uruguay, explicitly uh, move away from the rule of consensus. Uh, Uruguay announced that it was starting negotiations of a free trade agreement with China, without the consensus of the other member states. Brazil last year decided to reduce its import tariff by 20% uh, without uh, uh, any acceptance of its member states of, of Mercosur. Uh, so that's where we stand now in Mercosur. Uh, but with all these weaknesses, uh, we really think, I think there is a consensus in the four countries that Mercosur has a key role to play. Uh, in our development strategy of the four countries. Uh, and just to, to mention one, which is, I think, key, especially in this nowadays world, uh, which is becoming the platform of uh, member state integration in the world economy. Uh, for member states, especially for the little brothers of Mercosur, which include Argentina, uh, it's not the same to start negotiations with any country in the world being, for instance, the 25th economy in the world, than doing it together with Brazil and Mercosur, which would be uh, the sixth economy of the world. Uh, obviously, for that to work, you need a window of opportunity, of political opportunity. Uh, that window might be near. Uh, uh, so we will have to work in making some adjustments in Mercosur to make it work. Thank you. Federico, thank you very much. Um, uh, a slightly bleak picture, uh, but uh, that's good. If it's, a, if it's an honest and realistic one, we, we need to have an honest, realistic look at it. There's a few um, items coming through on the chat. We'll, we'll do instructions to everybody. What I'm going to try and do just for people watching is get a conversation going between the panellists. But please do throw in your observations, questions, and I will try and sort of weave those into the into the discussion that we're planning to have over the next hour or so. Right, thank you, uh, Federico. Um, third up, third of four is Georgina Eyre, who is the Acting Head of Trade Policy, or LATAC, in the Department of International Trade, the UK Department of International Trade. And just to give you a little bit of background, Georgina assumed her role as Acting Deputy Consul General of the British Consulate in Sao Paulo, in September 2022, so only a few months ago. Previously, she served as Prosperity Councillor in Brasilia, overseeing trade, economics, science and development. And immediately prior to Brazil, where she clearly has accumulated considerable experience, Georgina was Director of the Prosperity Fund in India, and before that served in Eritrea, South Africa, Tanzania and New York. So. That is a broad spectrum of perspectives that you can bring to this. Georgina, over to you. Thanks very much. And yes, um, a world of experience, um, including um, here in, in Brazil, as you, as you say. 
um, and relatively new still into um, the regional role. So bear with me um, on that one. But obviously, Brazil is a country that I am in the market that I'm most familiar with here. But thanks for the opportunity. Um, I think this is a great um, and really interesting um, panel to get together at a really important time. So thank you um, to Kenny House for doing that. And I'm really looking forward to hearing not only the views of other panelists, um, but also from um, colleagues who are um, watching. Um, so looking forward to some interesting questions and, and thoughts from, from others as well. I thought helpful just to start off with a quick kickstart. Um, where are we in terms of the UK on our trade priorities? Um, the DIT Secretary of State helpfully set these out for us um, in Lancaster House. Um, so running through those, um, where are we at? So we're really focused on removing barriers to trade. So helping UK business sell um, to more countries and expand and create um, new jobs and higher wages. Um, we want to grow UK exports year on year until we've hit our race to a trillion. Um, we want to make the UK a top investment destination in Europe. Um, we want to seal high quality deals with India and the CPTPP, um, and we want to defend free trade. So within that context, let me just really start by emphasising um, that Mercosur is an important trading partner for the UK. Our total trading goods and services reached 9.1 billion um, in the four quarters to the end of quarter two in 2022, um, and that's an increase. Um, and that's not an easy thing to do, um, particularly um, in the context of having gone through the pandemic, etc. Um, but it is an increase of 22.1%, um, or in monetary terms, 1.7 billion um, compared to the previous year. And Brazil alone makes up 71.6% of all trade with, with the bloc. Um, so our bilateral relationship with Brazil is worth 6.5 billion. At the moment, um, trade with Mercosur is dominated by goods, which make up about 65.3% of that total. Um, but while the majority of our inputs are foods and other agricultural products, our top two exports are in me mechanical power generators and um, medicinal and pharmaceutical products. Um, won't be any surprise, beverages, um, including Scotch whiskey, come in third place, um, always a good thing, 7.7% um, um, or um, 219 million of our total trade. And I think just on that point, it's really worth noting, noting that when it comes to mass market access barriers, we continue to pursue recognition of Scotch GI and number of the Mercosur um, markets and hope to see progress um, on that. But of course, there's more that we can do, um, not only to deepen, but to diversify the UK's relationship within um, the region. And because UK Mercosur trade accounted for just 06 Sorry, yeah, 0.6% of the UK's total trade in, in the four quarters at the end of 2022. Um, and the UK's total market share um, in Mercosur was just 1.3% um, in 2021. Um, we want to, we're often asked, um, both here and, in, and, and at home in the UK, um, when will we start to negotiate an FTA um, with Mercosur? And we've been really clear on that, and I want to be clear here, that the UK still has ambitions to pursue a high quality FTA with Mercosur in the future. Right now, our negotiators are focused on concluding live negotiations, including the CPTPP um, and our um, FTA with, with Mexico. Um, both part of our ambition to put the UK at the centre of the work of modern deals spanning Americas and the Pacific. But, is the, not the only way of deepening our relationship with Mercosur. So in the meantime, we're not standing still. As I said before, our, we have a strong focus on removing MABs, um, such as Scotch GI that I mentioned earlier, and increasing our overall trade cooperation. You said it, Jeremy, um, we have a new, new government here in Brazil, um, and that presents us with the chance to explore new opportunities um, to, to achieve our overall goal, as I say, of, of deepening and diversifying that trading relationship. President Lula has been really clear, he was really clear in his speech um, when he first um, took over, um, that he wants to be more than just an exporter of commodities. Um, he said that he wants to build a modern trading relationship and invest in the green and digital economies. And the UK is really well placed um, to, to develop that partnership and to really drive forward the opportunities to strengthen trade um, in both the green and digital space um, to, that's a benefit for both of our economies. So we really hope that the 12th meeting in the UK Brazil JETCO can take place this year. Um, that is one of our mechanisms for, for strengthening our bilateral relationship. Um, and we're very much looking forward to that, that going forward. But of course, the region isn't just about Brazil. 
Um, we've also held the UK Uruguay um, first meeting of our bilateral commercial dialogue in Montevideo last year. Um, and a second meeting this year will help us to continue to make progress um, with, with, with Uruguay, which is small, but a really important and ambitious partner. We're also working with Paraguay and Argentina um, to deepen trading relationships and investment relationships there. Um, and recently we've had the Argentinian Environment Secretary who will visit the UK um, next month to explore cooperation investment opportunities um, in energy and mining. So those are just some of the examples of where we as the UK are looking to strengthen our relationship um, with, with Mercosur um, to have stronger, stronger relationships. Um, and I see the coming years as being incredibly important um, for us doing that. And we're really looking forward to working not only here in Brazil, but across the region um, to see just how far we can go um, in making the most of those opportunities. Georgina, thank you. Um, excellent summary. We'll come back to a lot of those themes. Um, but first, or last of all, we're going to have our introduction from our final speaker. Um, Paolo, I'm really pleased that we have the voice of the EU because it's such a key uh, part of this conversation. So um, Paolo Garzotti, who's the head of the Latin American unit in the trade uh, directorate of the European Commission. Um, Paolo's Italian. Uh, national, but it's, as I say, head of the head of the unit responsible for relations with Latin America in the Directorate General uh, of the European Commission, the EU. In 1998, Paolo moved to the European Commission Directorate General for Trade, and he's been in charge of the division dealing with multilateral affairs, as well as the one responsible for coordinating trade policy with the Council and the European Parliament. And, and Paolo, it's great you're here because you know, if you put a word search in Mercosur, it would come up with failure to deliver EU trade agreement as probably the number one top item on the Google search. I'm not saying that to be critical of the EU necessarily, but this is the sort of ghost at the feast. You know, this, this is the, this deal that, that is always on the horizon, but you never seem to be able to quite get to the horizon in order to seize the prize. So it would be fascinating to hear from you. Um, a sort of inside track on, on what is happening, uh, what the realistic prospects are. And I think, you know, that has implications for how we view Mercosur more widely, because I think it would transform people's ideas about Mercosur's potential and its ability to turn theory into practice if something substantial could be put in place with as big a block as the European Union. So um, over to you, it'd be great to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot, Jamie. Thanks to Kenny House for this opportunity and for the excellent paper that, 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 the, that you have produced. Um, indeed, uh, um, moving directly to, to your question, we have uh, uh, concluded politically, as we say, a deal with Mercosur in June uh, 2019. Uh, but since then, uh, the difficulties have been, uh, particularly on the EU side, to move this deal um, to a thorough finalization uh, and uh, uh, signature and ratification. Um, already two years ago, the executive vice president in charge for trade matters, uh, um, Madis Dombrowski, indicated uh, that he heard the criticism uh, at political and, and societal level that emerged in Europe, particularly environmental and deforestation issues. Uh, and that before putting the agreement up for signature, uh, the Commission would have uh, uh, addressed uh, this issue, notably by means of uh, an additional instrument uh, uh, that would have uh, um, improved uh, um, um, the commitments in this field. And as well, uh, he asked for uh, what, what is a change on, uh, on the ground. Um, this was three years ago, but seems like uh, um, a century ago. Many things have changed. Uh, and uh, the geopolitical value of uh, an agreement with Mercosur today uh, is, um, uh, can hardly be overrated. Uh, first of all, is a region that, we, that Europe has probably somehow uh, taken for granted, you know, I like uh, old and good friends or oh, in Italy for us is la mamma, the mother, you, you take it for granted, the most important closest people. Uh, 
um, because of cultural links uh, and, and, and historical links and investment and trade links, uh, it's time to, uh, to go back in a, a constructive uh, way towards uh, uh, Latin America in general and Mercosur specifically. Um, we, uh, Latin America is probably the region that suffered most in the world from the pandemic, though that's, uh, and, 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 and Brazil and Argentina as well. So there is need for more trade and investment uh, for the region. The European Union with the situation uh, and uh, aggression of Russia to Ukraine clearly uh, is in, uh, in search of uh, diversifying its partners while uh, having trading and uh, fostering trading and investment with partners that are reliable and uh, share our values. There are little places better than Latin America for that. And, and, and of course, of Mercosur and Argentina uh, and Brazil. We're going to have uh, a summit um, with uh, uh, Latin America. It's been just decided in Buenos Aires, it's going to be the 17th and 18th of July. Uh, and that would be a, an excellent uh, occasion to, um, to move forward in our relations. Uh, as for the deal itself, um, you can see this move uh, in the, in the importance that the region and Mercosur has taken in the State of the Union um, speech by the president of the commission, Mercosur was some, some implicit, to put it away. In the uh, speech in Davos, she clearly said uh, that we need to start talking again about the Mercosur deal. And uh, in the parliament a few days ago, she said in front of the plenary that there's a unique window of opportunity uh, this year to. Um, to move ahead with the agreement. Um, therefore, indeed, I think that uh, on the environment side, that was deforestation side, that was a critical point. Uh, it cannot be denied that uh, having uh, now a government like uh, Lula's government with Marina Silva as Minister of Environment and what Brazil already has, 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 has shown in, the, in Sharm el Sheikh uh, at the COP and in the Biodiversity Convention as well, we we're going to be moving in the right direction. Uh, there are some elements to which Emily referred uh, as well internally that uh, put the debate on environment and deforestation in a different place. The uh, EU has ratified, as um, is in the process of adopting a regulation on deforestation, which is 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 the target of some criticism, of course, from from our partners. So we try to make sure that. Uh, is implemented uh, and, and uh, in, um, in a manner that does not affect our trade. But the, the, the risk of having uh, trade um, uh, as a component of deforestation, clearly with, when, with that regulation in place, is, uh, is basically um, eliminated. So I do see uh, the 2023 as generally a special year for the relations between the EU and Latin America, and more specifically for Mercosur. And uh, in the words of, of, of our president, I see this as a unique opportunity for both of us, because uh, when um, Federico was saying that, I, I tend to agree with the, with the, with the, with the I could say that the downbeat assessment of the successes of Mercosur. Uh, not being able to close uh, and finalize our deal, uh, it would be probably a, a defeat for the regional integration of Latin America, which is key and is something to which Lula, but as well, Boric, Petro, many leaders in the, in, the, in the region are attached to. It would be a defeat for the EU of not being able to uh, uh, promote a closer relation. <laughs> what something is not just a trade deal, but is that really a political partnership and something probably beyond that, that we are trying to, to ground in this, in this agreement. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. Paolo, thank you very much. Um, right, let, let's get the ball rolling. And um, I'm gonna sort of ask the existential question, which is that after 30 years, has Mercosur had enough time to demonstrate its value? And it's been underwhelming to put it kindly. And this is the tone of some of the questions you'll see coming through. Um, why should Uruguay and Paraguay be handcuffed by the rigid Mercosur framework, et cetera, et cetera? 
Um, and it says, you know, Brazil have had all of this time to to get things moving, and they haven't. Why should why should everybody be bogged down? It said by uh, by the sort of inertia that it seems so sort of central to Mercosur's inability to strike deals with external partners. So I suppose the big question is, um, does Mercosur work? I mean, is it would you invent it if it didn't exist already? Or would it just have been much easier for the EU to have sought to do some sort of bilateral deal with the component parts of Mercosur? And if one of them, say the Argentinians, weren't very happy, okay, but, but, but you still nailed down something with Uruguay, Paraguay, and obviously biggest prize of all, Brazil. It, is, the, is, the, is the ability to only move at the pace of the slowest country a recipe for inaction, sclerosis, and ultimately means Mercosur is not fit for purpose? We don't have to have everybody addresses in turn because I think that's a bit rigid. We'll keep it flowing, everyone have a go. But maybe Emily, you've been, you you've been longer since you spoke, but anyone have any views on whether Mercosur is, and let me put it this way, is it a fundamentally flawed concept? And if not, how long does it have to prove that it isn't? Over to I'll you. be very brief in, in, in my response to that. It's really interesting. We get two sides of this conversation. So there are those that say, oh, we need to have a single market. Mercosur should look like the European Union. It should try to integrate, right? Forgetting that European integration has been a, a long haul, um, it still is. We still have questions around single market issues every day. Um, I'm based here in Brussels and, uh, well, you're, you're sitting in the UK. There are, there are uh, tensions with regards to how far you can integrate. So often I think there's a fallacy to look at Mercosur and wanting to see it as a reproduction of ourselves, which is that we're sitting in a very harmonized market. Um, on the other hand, we get uh, a number of other observers saying it's too rigid. Uh, all these countries should be able to strike, uh, negotiate, strike trade deals on their own. And um, actually, they're being held back by this structure. In effect, I think that the, the answer lies, you know, unfortunately, in that gray zone. It's a customs union, which is imperfect. It will probably remain imperfect. But are we better without it than with it? Um, I would tend to believe that Mercosur is not going anywhere. It needs reform. It needs to move forward. There are a number of hindrances uh, that can be tackled. Um, but not having Mercosur um, is not uh, is not something that's on the, on the books, right? Um, and you mentioned the case of, for instance, Argentina. Let's not forget that this uh, EU Mercosur agreement um, had foreseen the eventuality that one of the Mercosur members wouldn't uh, ratify it, and so the application of the agreement can come into force uh, for uh, any Mercosur member that applies it. Uh, not necessarily requiring all four of the uh, original members uh, to have uh, ratified for the others to enter the agreement into force. And it's the imperfection of the customs union that allows that to happen. If we're talking now about bilaterals, it's also because the structure as it is set today um, allows that. Um, it's, not that it's necessarily what you would want to be doing. I suppose the difficulty always is you you sign up for a block and and you know you're you're bound by the collective nature of the block. The prize is bigger because the block is bigger. But um, Carla, I mean, I mean, you you know you're representing a block of twenty seven nation states. Um, you know, it's a lot of people. Big you know big economy. The the European Union, wider single market, slightly bigger still. Um, on the other hand, you know, you've got to go around a lot of a lot of people to get their their buy in. Is it? And then you find out the same at the other end of the equation. Is this? Are you tearing your hair out? Would it be easier to try and uh, nail down agreements with individual Latin American nation states? Uh, it's not necessarily. It depends on uh, which state uh, coming. Coming back to Mercosur, clearly the fact that now Argentina is importing more uh, from China than from Brazil, um, which is last year, 2021 uh, data, uh, shows that it's not just a matter of imperfect customs union. It is a matter of, of uh, some reform uh, um, uh, needed. Uh, the European Union is 
if you want, I, I um, modestly would say the best example of uh, a successful uh, regional integration. Of course, for that to happen, you need many components. You need time. You need a certain balance uh, between the components of this um, regional integration. Um, if one is too big, too strong, too powerful, uh, it's difficult to find uh, to find a balance. And you and you need some kind of overall general um, uh, political. I'm, I'm not saying left or right, but you know, uh, thinking in terms of what trade and investment uh, can do for. Um, for, 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 for the block. This was not the case uh, in Mercosur for us. Was, was the case at the beginning. Um, it didn't happen because when it should have happened or, or immediately after, uh, uh, the important crisis, um, uh, particularly uh, affecting Argentina, have taken place. It's true, we have an agreement that can enter into force uh, uh, as well uh, um, if uh, some of the Play, uh, some of the countries do not ratify, but the idea is not to have an agreement just with one country. The idea is to allow for the benefits of the agreement to kick in as countries ratify. Yeah. Uh, so avoiding either the possibility to block or giving, you know, giving the political space to 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 to, to delay if needed uh, a ratification of one country or the other. But the objective is to have. Uh, a region to region agreement and to uh, and, and and to create a, a regional uh, um, uh, increased regional integration in um, in uh, in um, uh, in Mercosur as well. Uh, you know, Uruguay has started uh, is trying to start a negotiation with China for the last uh, uh, for, for quite some time, a couple of years um, since they announced it the first time almost. Uh, China uh, started and concluded negotiation with Ecuador in 10 months, basically. So if China wanted to have uh, an agreement with Uruguay very soon, um, um, they probably could have done it. Uh, that's my assessment. So uh, many players see that region as a region that you have to consider as a block and see the potential for uh, a, a, that region um, to, to be considered as such, or to take an advantage of uh, uh, the possibility of, uh, of, of Mercosur as a deal. has been delayed, but we still hope that we'll get there. Federico, I'm interested in your perspective um, as an Argentinian too. I mean, I mean is, uh, the, yeah. is the problem too little integration? I mean, probably, you know, we have the European, but I mean, it's a big step. Having a, a you know European Commission is a sort of supranational, not just the Council of Ministers. This has a sort of authority above the nation states. It's a serious pooling of sovereignty. Is there going to be an Argentinian Brazilian single currency? Um, it, is is this, I mean, is this a sort of theoretical way of meshing Mercosur more, more coherently together that in practice is a non-starter? Are we doomed to have Mercosur in this sort of halfway house? State. I, mean, no, I don't put, put a question to your mouth or, or, or thought about, you know, be interested to hear your perspective on, on whether it sits in a sort of happy place or whether the equilibrium is not quite right. Right. Uh, I would say first that uh, there is, in general, consensus in Mercosur, in Mercosur countries, that the vision of Mercosur is right. I mean, that's the way. Uh, it's all, I think there is also consensus, growing consensus in Mercosur that it's not working. So we need to do something. Uh, second, there is a big difference with the European Union, which is that we have a very big player in Mercosur, which is uh, away, far away from the other countries. Uh, Brazil represents roughly three fourths of Mercosur GDP. If you take that proportion and make the sort of parallel to the European Union, it would mean that you would have a country in the EU, which would be uh, the sum of, uh, in the EU 28, of uh, Germany, France, the UK, uh, Italy, uh, Netherlands. And it's Spain. a bit like the asymmetry of England within the United Kingdom. 
actually it creates a sort of tensions but but yeah anyway sorry well uh, yeah definitely so, so it, it it creates tensions but it's also a different dynamic uh, i mean I, I don't think it would work to have more institutions uh, supranational uh, agencies that wouldn't work in mercosur i mean a country like brazil why would it accept something like that mm -hmm. uh, it's a question of reforms so maybe on the decision making process on some specific issues in the decision making process but it's mostly because of this particular feature of mercosur it's mostly about leadership it's mostly about brazil so uh, when mercosur moves forward it's because brazil decides yeah. this is the direction well, and oh, that's what it, uh, Brazil should do, which is to compensate the smaller countries as the European uh, Union does. Uh, but if, but if, Brazil is too big to, to be sort of constrained within a supranational institution, yeah. uh, is, is the, uh, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, maybe the model is something closer to sort of ASEAN than the European Union, where, where the, which seems to have some sort of ability to cooperate effectively among the 10, but there's no, they talk of it being a supranational institution, not that I'm aware of. No, you don't have this bit of power of any country, so that, that's that's a challenge. But that's a challenge that the, the big brother of Mercosur should be able and was able to manage many times. So it's a question of of, of the window of, of, of opportunity. Uh, maybe we are looking at one now. You need some alignment between at least Argentina and Brazil. Uh, and when you have that, you have this, I, I was saying, uh, the dynamic in Mercosur is sporadic. You have very short periods of a lot of activity, and those periods are basically when you have Brazilian leadership and alignment with Argentina and the will of Brazil to compensate the smaller countries. So if, if Brazil and Argentina decide that we need to go ahead with Mercosur European Union, we, we think it's uh, a very balanced and it makes a lot of sense to get into that agreement, uh, at least from the Mercosur side, it should work. But the question yeah. is, is the European Union prepared to sign an agreement with Mercosur nowadays in this context, which is really different from the one that we had in 90, uh, in 2019, when we uh, finished this uh, agreement in principle? Can I, can I just, Georgine, so I'll come to you in a moment, but I get the sort of sense that the, the panel accepts that Mercosur is rather is imperfect but doesn't think that it is viable to be heavily integrated probably doesn't wish to see it become a looser federation with with countries going their own way to a greater extent i don't know maybe if people who favors and so in a way we're sort of fated to continue to exist in this slightly sort of limbo in between state if we don't want to integrate more and we don't want to integrate less you just have to sort of sit there and hope that periodically there's an alignment of interest between Brazil and Argentina or there is particular Brazilian leadership and you get a sort of leap forward in terms of Mercosur's dynamism. Is that is that a... Georgina, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering your perspective as um, representing the British government. Of course, the case, I leave aside whether people think Brexit is a good or bad idea. There seems to be there's an obvious case for Britain having a different mindset post Brexit, which is we are part of a smaller block. Clearly, we're not part of a block at all. We're, we're you know, United Kingdom stands on its own. But with that comes greater operational flexibility. Because you you obviously don't have to agree as one of 28 as as Britain was when we were members of the European Union. Is that is that greater flexibility able to be deployed in the in the Mercosur or the more widely the South American context? I mean, would it I mean rather than having to wait for for Paolo and everybody at the Commission to try and line everybody up on both sides of the Atlantic, should Britain be diving in and trying to do bilateral deals with Uruguay and it's a you know, small country, but per head GDP, it's it's right up there alongside Chile as the as the richest country in South America. Should we be trying to nail down a few a few prizes using our greater flexibility that we inevitably have because we're no longer part of a bigger block? Thanks, Jeremy. I mean, like 
is, does the UK have greater flexibility? Um, are we seeking to um, have more trade deals globally? Absolutely. Um, and you're starting to see that um, in terms of us um, starting um, negotiations um, with countries on new FTAs, having rolled over um, existing FTAs, um, India being um, a good example of that at the moment. Um, in terms of Mercosur, Mercosur does exist on a block and it's not for me to have an opinion on whether or not it's a perfect or imperfect um, block and, and, and the need for reform. But as I said earlier, um, would it be the UK's ambition um, in the future to have an FTA with Mercosur as a, as a block and do we have the flex to do that? Um, yes. Oh, I can't hear you, Jeremy, apologies. Would it, would it be um, better to, you know, there are two ways of approaching, I suppose. One is to try and get the big prize of a UK Mercosur deal. And the other is to try and, you know, chop the prize up into its component parts and try and do a whole series of bilateral deals that get you to the same endpoint, but incrementally and maybe faster. Look, as you say, I mean, an FTA is is an endpoint. Um, does that preclude us from strengthening our bilateral relationships um, with other countries? Brazil, they've talked about um, Uruguay, Argentina, etc. No, it doesn't, and, and we continue to make progress um, on that, um, and we will continue to strengthen those those relationships. And, and should um, would a UK Mercosur deal basically? piggyback on the EU's work would it be a would it be a sort of would we cross out the words EU and write the words yeah. UK and <laughs> add a few extra paragraphs at the end about whiskey uh, or, or or um or do you think we could we I say we because I'm, I'm British but we could um try and try and imagine the relationship between the UK and Mercosur in a slightly different way than the European Union has imagined it I wish I had an answer for that. Um, I think that's getting into a level of detail that we're not yet, yet at. Probably I'm wise to talk on that. that. We'll <laughs> get a politician on to answer that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that and, and, and everyone, should, should Mercosur uh, go, go the other? I mean, I think the answer is probably, if it's, if it's slightly difficult to get it to agree to things at the moment, why make it even harder? But should it expand? Should it, should it, should it sign up? Bolivia, I mean, it doesn't make very much difference to the overall GDP of, of, um, of Mercosur, but uh, obviously it adds an extra nation state. Or is, is this just oh, Venezuela? Or is this just um, a recipe for all of these uh, issues becoming even more, more uh, significant um, if there are even more component parts within the machine? Should it be bigger? Is the is the goal? Is the big ambition that it covers the whole of South America in due course? With that, I mean, if you had, if you were seeking to paint a vision for the middle of the century, with a China World Trade Block, an American World Trade Block, an EU World Trade Block, should there be a South American trade block? Is that the big vision, or is the lesson in Mercosur that that would be undeliverable? Uh, I, I can give some yeah. thoughts on that. <clears throat> uh, I, I really don't think that's the way. Uh, I mean, we I think we agree that uh, Mercosur has become too rigid for the four members. So it, it won't make much sense to, to add more members to that rigid structure. Uh, on top of on top of that, uh, I used to say that uh, customs union are uh, a species in extinction. Uh, if if you see the statistics. Uh, that there were many customs unions at the beginning of all this trend, but then all the, 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 the bulk of all the agreements that were signed after the 90s, all of them are free trade agreements. Uh, now it makes more sense uh, to look at war. I mean, and, and it, it goes to the, to the previous question of, of do, do we have to, to, to make, uh, to, to, to mirror the European Union Mercosur to have a complete internal market, to, to complete our external Tariff, etc. I, I think that was the vision at the beginning of Mercosur of uh, uh, an enlarged market. Uh, I, I don't see. I'm not sure that that's, that's the vision uh, nowadays. Nowadays, I think that we are. Uh, th there is a growing consensus that Mercosur should look outwards, uh, and for that, uh, you you can work on the internal market. You can work on on, on all these pending issues. The, 
the double collection issue. I mean, it's too technical. I have many issues, pending issues in Arco here. Uh, but maybe if we have to focus the effort, it should be on the external agenda. Yeah. If we manage to have an ambitious and successful external agenda, we will give value to Mercosur. And we will uh, lower the frustration of, of all or most of its members. We will give a, an institutional anchor to Mercosur. This is key. It's, it's not only about opening markets. It's about saying the world, we are going to, to, to have the same rules that the, most of the world has in, in trade relations. But, but, your, but your view, very is essentially, uh, if you're running Mercosur, uh, the priority is to look out, outside South America, not to look within South America in terms of the future. But, no, it's good. So, sorry, sorry, we already have free trade agreements with any with, with, country. With, with the other America. neighboring countries anyway. Yeah, yeah. We're in free trade with all the Latin America. What, yeah. what, what else yeah. we, do we need? I mean, to, to negotiate together, we cannot manage that uh, being four countries. Can we manage external negotiations being 10 countries of Latin America? It wouldn't work. No, the, lo the logic suggests that's not a sensible. I, I was going to move on to something else, but I keep getting it in the question. So I'm going to, so let's get it out of the way. Um, the questions don't quite put it like this, but let, let me. Uh, are Brazil and Argentina are going to have the same currency as each other in 10 years' time? Um, put your hand up if you think that that is going to happen. Put your hand up if you think it should happen. There you go. Everybody's submitting the questions. Don't. This is a red herring, as they say in English. This is uh, no one seems to think this. Uh, this is this manifestation of union is going to is going to happen soon. Now, um, I've got a question that's a bit more sort of critical of, of Uruguay because people always, you know, a lot of people hold Uruguay up as the sort of fleet of foot. Um, uh, you know, it's slightly more free market, slightly more imaginative, trying to do deals with China while every they're being held back by the. Brazilians and the Argentinians in particular. But this one's a bit more critical. It says, why, why is Uruguay thinking about deals with, with countries like China rather than devoting its energies to trying to get the EU Mercosur deal over the line? Paolo, maybe you could go, you know, is there a danger that people move on from the EU deal before it's even happened properly? That, you know, one thing at a time. Let let this is this is the prize that's been in front of Mercosur's eyes for a number of years. Wait a sec on whatever other part of the world you're looking at. Let's apply ourselves to getting this thing done and signed off, and then we can move on. Mercosur, we can move on to you know wherever other part of the world. I mean, is that is that a sort of frustration that people are sort of moving on before they finish the previous thing? E yeah, thank you. I, I think I think uh, on Uruguay, uh, one cannot uh, blame Uruguay not to have done uh, um, whatever it could uh, in terms uh, of promoting uh, the Mercosur agenda of uh, um, in, in the trade. And is definitely not U Uruguay, and recently not in general, uh, the Mercosur countries where the problem was uh, in terms of moving with the signature or ratification of this agreement. It, it was mainly in the um, debate in Europe on how trade issues contribute to uh, sustainable development and to what extent trade agreements uh, should be used uh, and, and should include uh, uh, provisions in that, in that sense. Um, one can understand the, the frustration of uh, Uruguay. Uruguay is clearly, and we got in Europe as well, eh, uh, countries where uh, the threat of, uh, uh, which is there, of uh, uh, trade liberalization having uh, an impact on uh, um, jobs, uh, industry uh, in the country is lesser than in other countries in, uh, in Mercosur, and therefore uh, is less costly, uh, whereas Uruguay has great potential, particularly in agriculture, uh, to, uh, to, to, to export. But I think uh, that, you know, in a relations like the one the EU and Mercosur, clearly you need, um, in order to move ahead, uh, stars to be aligned. And I think uh, this year, uh, we got a universe with stars uh, pretty aligned because President Lula said that he wants to sort out 
the agreement with the EU in the first six months of, uh, of his mandate. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen said that there's a window of, of opportunity. Of course, uh, uh, I tend to agree with Federico, with all due respect, that when uh, uh, Brazil and when Brazil with a, with a government like Lula government uh, considers if you really find a, a way to move ahead, uh, I think the others uh, will, 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 will probably see the opportunity. Paolo, so could, this is it, these are, let, let me go to you, Emily, we'll go round. How, how big a deal is it changing the president of Brazil from Bolsonaro to Lula? I mean, <laughs> I mean, and, 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 and let me ask a slightly more contentious supplementary question. Is, will it be a further additional big deal if Argentina changes its presidency uh, after the Brazilians when their elections take place later this year. But come, 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 maybe that's too much distraction. So is it, it, it is, is, Lula about, getting in, think, is Lula getting in going to make the difference between getting this over the line or not getting mm -hmm. it over the line? Uh, and therefore, you know, that might end up in some ways being one of the big consequentials of his, of his victory in the presidential election. There is no doubt that the elections in Brazil will have made a significant difference to what's about to happen now. Uh, simply, uh, we haven't had, uh, you know, uh, a commission executive vice president go to Brazil in a number of years. We're going to see heads of state uh, go to Brazil and to the wider Mercosur countries um, in these first six months. Th that is a question. Also, because there's a lot of pressure from other uh, uh, great powers. Uh, the US, China is also uh, 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 knocking at the door, asking what's going to happen next. So in this, there are going to be big decisions that are going to have to be made. One of the things that is very clear to me in this scenario is that the EU-Mercosur trade agreement or association agreement, the wider agreement, is the absolute priority now in terms of international trade. Um, what is less uh, clear is how the uh, relationship with China is going to be managed. Um, right after, um, uh, of course, Uruguay had pointed out uh, 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 to the fact that uh, there was a willingness to open trade negotiations with China, the actual negotiations per se have never really lifted off the ground. But what we did see is that when President Lula came back from Montevideo this week, it was floated that after the ratification of the EU Mercosur agreement, the opening of negotiations with, with China was on the on the table. Now, in my view, uh, that's not particularly the right way forward for Mercosur. Um, there is already a strong uh, dependency on China in terms of external trade. And if we're looking to use trade as a lever to build resilience, um, that comes through market diversification. So um, it, it, rather than creating further dependency on China, uh, one would imagine that it, it's probably smarter to look to, um, to, to create a number of uh, a network of free trade agreements to be able to ensure that you are better prepared to systemic shocks, such as um, the, the recent uh, 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 illegal invasion of Russia, of Ukraine, and the kind of crises that that can create in, in international supply chains. Looking at an agreement between the UK and Mercosur uh, uh, region as an example, uh, coming back to your earlier question as to whether it would be a mirror agreement of the EU Mercosur agreement, I, I would tend to believe that Georgina's colleagues uh, in the Department of International Trade are, are, are smart enough to understand that the offensive interests of the UK are not that of the EU. You have a very different trade makeup, you have different defensives, different offensives, and therefore the way that you would be negotiating your market access clauses as well as, uh, for instance, uh, services on the financial services side or questions relating to higher education would be uh, those that you'd be putting forward in an agreement um, um, uh, as such. And if we look at the recent agreements, for instance, New Zealand, uh, where we do have templates, uh, EU and UK with the same country uh, post uh, Brexit, we see that there are significant differences to those negotiations, uh, to the actual uh, uh, trade agreement. There are different uh, ways of looking, for instance, at an environmental chapter, uh, sustainable development amongst others. So I believe in the capacity of UK trade negotiators uh, uh, to figure out what is best for the UK and also Mercosur negotiators in the same right uh, to, to figure out what is best uh, of their best interest in looking at the UK as an external uh, trading market. Ultimately, the most important, and when we're looking at globalization today and international trade agreements, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier today, we, the, 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 we have a paradigm shift. 
what we need to be looking at is, is resilience through diversification of markets. So that should be top of mind. Um, rather than everybody talk about Lula, do the other three panellists, if they want to volunteer a view, broadly agree that the prospects for Mercosur being more ambitious, specifically with regards to the EU, are enhanced by Lula becoming president rather than Bolsonaro being re-elected? Is that the consensus? Yeah. So, so what, what, what would be the hypothesis again? That, uh, the, the, that Lula's election makes an, a Mercosur EU deal more likely than had Bolsonaro been re-elected. Yes, definitely. I, I think that there is a broad consensus on that. The question is, what is behind this first layer of problem, which was like, uh, everything is anything behind that because now we would see real problems or problems. I mean, it's only about deforestation now, well, or is it about uh, meat farmers in France as well? Uh, I think that the, the question is yeah. still there. No, no, indeed, and, and indeed, you know, the idea that Lula is a, a great international crusader for liberal uh, economics and trade is some people might regard as a a stretch to put it politely yeah tell, tell, tell me more tell me more generally everybody given the direction of the biden administration in the us and all these subsidies that are being brought in you know it, 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 I mean, the idea is to try and support a, a green transition but it's all this you know if you buy an american produced car then you get a discount and all the firms getting discounts and but this is a form of sort of protectionism not even a very well hidden form of protectionism and, and a sort of, um, you know, reshoring or onshoring, whatever jargon is used. But whether whether the danger is with EU Mercosur deal that it, if it does ever get to the finishing line, it feels sort of dated almost at the point of inception. That it that it it reflects a way of thinking about international trade and these big deals that is already going a bit out of vogue as as. Uh, the EU itself to some extent, but certainly the Americans, um, if, if turn their backs maybe a bit strong, but but um, embrace globalization with less zeal than they would have done 10 years ago. Are we moving away from a big trade deal globalized mentality, um, uh, which causes, you know, which means that maybe Merck's ultimately we need to focus on on being a a more efficient internal market rather than winning these great prizes on the world stage with its external relations. I suppose we invite you to ask the, the, the sort of overall context that Mercosur sits within. Well, if you'll allow me on that one, Jeremy, um, yeah. there is a very different uh, scenario if you're the US or Mercosur. The US already has a very strong web of free trade agreements. So it's already sitting on that liberalization as the EU is. Um, uh, the, the difference here is that Mercosur doesn't have any of these trade agreements, so needs to open markets. And I don't think it's a dated agreement when we look at the tariff element of it. This is one of the biggest trade agreements that the EU has ever uh, uh, negotiated in terms of the tariff elimination that it provides. Uh, and that is because Mercosur countries um, uh, have always sit, sat behind this high uh, tariff protection. Um, and so so essentially, it's, I, I think that it's still valid. Uh, if I may, Jeremy, I completely yeah. agree with Emily. Uh, I mean, uh, this question of the Mercosur European Union trade agreement could be dated for a country like Chile or Colombia, they have free trade agreements with 80%, 60% of world GDP. Mercosur has free trade agreements with less than 8% of world GDP. So for Mercosur, this is a starting point. I mean, we are not asking ourselves, as maybe Chile nowadays, have we gone too far? We're just starting yeah. the way. Wow. It's the very, yeah. That is the statistic of the day. That disparity between Chile and Colombia and Mercosur is very, very stark, isn't it? Very interesting. Yeah. George, Georgina, can I ask your perspective on... on, 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 on we were told by the British government that the biggest, the biggest trade deal prize for the year ahead is the CPTPP, which, of course, has South American 
well slightly weird though is uruguay i can't even though they're they're not a pacific nation mind you britain could hardly be further from the pacific and, and we're quite keen to join so but in geographically you've got the you know the chileans and the peruvians if um if you're sitting around a table in london talking about priorities for your part of the world that you're based in is is um is the sort of south american component of cptpp uh, a more immediate and therefore alluring prize than trying to do something with mercosur thanks jeremy yeah i mean look um we're we're currently not members of cptpp um, and our accession is ongoing, as you know, so it's not really for me to comment in terms of whether or not others um, should be joining at this point. Um, but is the conclusion of those discussions with CPTPP a priority? Absolutely. Um, and for the year ahead, um, I think as our Secretary of State has said, that concluding um, both the discussions with CPTPP and with India um, are, are priorities. So yes, I think looking at it from a sort of where we sit within the region, absolutely, CPTPP is a priority for us at the moment. Georgia, can I ask you a hugely political question, but uh, feel free not to answer it. I can't promise to answer it. <laughs> it's um, for a, a British government or a, a British politician who, with a, a belief in and a commitment to Brexit, which is the, the position of the British government, um, the EU being able to conclude a successful trade deal with Mercosur when the United Kingdom had not uh, has political implications, not just trade implications, does it not? I mean, it, 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 part of it, I, I, I might think um, it, it would help to underline to the other 27 existing member states, if there was any doubt, that sticking with the EU was much more in their commercial interests than seeking to go it alone. In other words, this isn't just about trade. In the context of Brexit, I realise this is a rather UK-centric way of looking at the world, in the context of Brexit, it's also quite important that the EU shows that it can do the business for its 27 member states. And it's quite important that Britain shows that it can do the business for itself, that it can, you know, that it can stand on its own feet. I mean, it, it, uh, is there, am I being too political or, or am I, <laughs> do you not, not want to see it in those terms? Um, I think that is one um, for the politicians, as you say, but I would say, you know, we are successfully agreeing um, new FTAs. We have Australia, we have New Zealand. As I say, we're seeking to conclude with India, with CPTC this year. Um, so is the UK going forward with, with being an independent trading nation? Absolutely. Um, and I think the proof is definitely in the pudding that we have, have concluded um, already um, some important, important FTAs. Very good. Paolo, you, you don't lower yourself to having these, these sort of political considerations to uh, your... Um... Just... But I wouldn't pass judgment on, on, on the <laughs> day, of course. Uh, the EU, we the first part of the mandate of this commission was in trade policy was more about the, the, the autonomy part of it. You know, we talk about strategic autonomy of the European Union. And um, in particular, the difficulties that we are going through the multilateral trading system and the WTO made that uh, the EU adopted some measures like uh, could be uh, CBAM, could be deforestation regulation, could be uh, the um, anti-coercion instrument, could be the public procurement uh, uh, instrument. But now clearly we are moving uh, and we have shown that uh, as this was the case in the past, uh, the EU can of course deliver on FTAs we have done uh, uh, New Zealand. We are in the process uh, of negotiating uh, Australia. We are as well uh, with India, Indonesia, um, uh, negotiating and and Mercos, uh, Chile, Mexico. So I think um, I, I I don't think they are out of fashion uh, these, these agreements. Uh, they have to be uh, they have to be negotiated and implemented in a different way than 15 years ago. And the society and the politicians are very attentive to impacts where um, that 20 or 15 years ago were not, were not relevant. And this translates, I, I give you just an anecdote. In the in, in DigiTrade where I work, um, the trade and sustainable development part of the business um, 
uh, in 2003-04 was uh, a three people team uh, in the unit on WTO that, where I was, uh, was working. Now we got two units of 15 people in Digitrade looking at this at these aspects of the of the negotiation. So I I think uh, I think trade is actually the risk is now uh, that trade is becoming generally uh, a victim a side victim of other shortcomings of globalization. I think on the Financial Times there was an article that was two days ago by, by Mr. Ganesh, quite, quite, uh, quite enlightening on, 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 on this. And- I, Sorry. Can yeah. I can also just, thank you. Can I just step back a little bit? Uh, I'm gonna ask a question which is not British centric, but is I suppose a bit Western centric, which is that do, by which I mean a, a sort of, I suppose, a, I suppose I sort of mean a Europe, North America, South America, Europe and the Americas. Um, large parts of the sort of democratic world do we need to collectively raise our game now you look at the you look at the performance of china since the turn of the century which has gone from being a fairly insignificant trading power in the south american context to being right up there you know vying with the americans and in some cases overtaking the americans definitely in the top two uh, its growth is absolutely extraordinary in South America. Meanwhile, we Westerners, if I can put it in 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 such limited terms, are going round and round in circles, failing to ratify things, delaying things, electing a president who doesn't like it, and then replacing him with a president who might like it, and then replacing. Is there? Does it challenge us more fundamentally that we are? You know we're spending too long looking at our feet rather than looking at the horizon that when the the world order is changing in front of our eyes china fair enough china's you know doing well advancing its own interests but china is transforming its role in latin america while we are you know well let's put it bluntly not transforming our institutional relationships uh in line with that with that um with that new reality is that, is that I mean is that fair that we that we're you know that we're too introspective that 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 if you're looking back at you know a hundred years from now you could yeah you, know, you could write a, a university thesis on on why the West sort of fumbled and dithered while China took over and you could cite this as part of the evidence that we collectively lacked urgency. But first of all, discuss you, that's why on, on the EU side, first of all, is clear that the competition uh, with China in the region is one of the elements that are very present to our industry and our politicians for promoting the deal is, is, is one of, of the elements, one of the many factors that makes me think that uh, uh, this year could be a positive one. Then China has a very different way of operating. Uh, as you know, uh, the, 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 the state capital system, China, the fact that they can direct uh, subsidies and capital in particular operation in those countries, uh, yeah, can lead to very quick advances. Now, can lead as well to um, uh, to big mistakes. Uh, and in the region, um, uh, for example, in Venezuela, uh, they they they've been losing quite a, a lot of money of opportunities. Mm -hmm. And my sense uh, is that one of the reason. Uh, why Mercosur and Latin American countries care about uh, a relation with the European Union is not just the trade matters. You know, the, the beef that we give in the Mercosur agreement is uh, basically uh, what Mercosur can export in 10 to 12 days uh, to China. But is as well the fact uh, that you, you don't want to put your eggs in the same basket. The point that was made before that if you if you already have trading 40 or 50 percent uh of, with china and you don't necessarily need a trade agreement as well because china to be perfectly frank has shown that it can use this um this leverage i, I there was a, a country when i was working in geneva as deputy ambassador there uh who, who, who takes took some position in a un um particular debate uh, and at a certain moment in time, export of the 
of, of that country to China was cut off for three months uh, and it was 50% of their exports. So you don't want necessarily um, bind yourself uh, entirely to that kind of... So yeah. we know that and, 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 and I think uh, we, our network of agreements is a way to, to do it. Is we need to find, and in, in Europe we are uh, studying this global gateway initiative uh, to try to, uh, with, with a different program and different values, if you want that the Belt and Road on China, but to, uh, to look uh, at how we can up uh, our game um, in the region and not only. Very interesting. Uh, the China dimension uh, uh, briefly, maybe uh, Federico, uh, Georgina, Emily, and that is um, China. Uh, I don't want to put it negative. I mean, China, China's you know pursuing China's interests. Fair enough, but you know, does does it add urgency? Does it? Is it a? Should we think that there is a price for standing still? Put it that way. If you're standing still, you're going backwards. That we need to we the west whether it's the eu or the uk or how mercosur views its external relationships needs to realize that inertia is not cost free in the china context i suppose that's one federico was any china thoughts well yes i mean uh, china has become uh, uh, maybe i just to correct or, or update uh, something which was very interesting that paolo said before uh, for a while China was the first export destination of Argentina. Now Brazil is our first export destination as it ever was in the last 20, 30 years. So if all the countries in the region have China as the first export destination, this is increasingly having uh, effects on the political aspects. I mean, China leverages on its uh, our dependency to its markets in other issues, not necessarily in trade. So definitely need to diversify our export destinations and this is in the interest of both uh, Mercosur because we don't want to be dependent on any country but also of other western central countries I mean you don't want us to be dependent on China uh, so it makes a lot of sense to help ourselves to increase our trade and just a very quick point uh, because we haven't uh, talked about this and I think it's a central point uh, it's not only about trade flows it's also and maybe mainly about investment. Uh, the European Union is the first, by far, the first uh, investor in Mercosur. Uh, and uh, an agreement like this will set, uh, 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 it will, will establish a set of rules which is uh, fundamental to increase and to consolidate yeah, uh, yeah. that investment flows in Mercosur. And this is a, this is a, this is a fact. I mean, we have been studying in Argentina where we were negotiating, uh, which was the effect of the trade agreement with the European Union and uh, FDI flows in the other countries. And it was very impressive. And, I mean, you can clearly see a, posit a positive and very uh, clear effect on investment after signing a free trade agreement with uh, the very European good. Union. Christina and Emily, in that order, any thoughts on, on China context? That was Georgina. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, look, I mean, China dynamic aside or not, I mean, inertia is, is something we would never settle for or, or aim yeah. for. And that's why, <laughs> um, and that's why, you know, as I said in, in my earlier um, opening, is why we've been we driving to increase um, the trade in goods and services. Um, and as I said before, with the block in the last last year, we've increased that by over 20%. Um, it's why we're continuing to, to, to remove our market access barriers. Um, and it's why we're, we're, we will continue to seek to drive economic growth, both in the UK and, and within the region, um, by, by deepening and diversifying our, our trading relationships. And there are, there are huge opportunities here going forward um, with, with the greening of the economy, with digital, with tech, with higher education, with, with health, et cetera. Um, there's real opportunity for us to, to strengthen our relationships here in, in the region. And that's what we will continue to push for. Thank you, Emily. You're, you're, you're muted, Emily. Oh, apologies. I would just say that the omission of Mercosur over the past few years uh, from Brussels did not go unnoticed in the region. Um, uh, the recent State of the Union was mentioned and Mercosur was not. Um, um, and so, 
there's there is a necessity now I think to really um from the European Commission and, and others but really to reset the strategic priority of this region within the conversation amongst member states um as was mentioned uh, it, it comes down to sometimes some very I would say uh tricky political details, but the remain details in a wider geopolitical setting of diversification and of building resilience. Um, again, we need to think of the, the, the fact that these are two regions that do have shared values um, and that will need each other as, uh, as we go forward. Um, the relationship to China is very different if you're looking at it from a Mercosur perspective. Um, the EU uh, looks at China as a, and, and Paolo, do correct me, but as a strategic partner and a systemic rival, right? I think that the <laughs> view from Mercosur is slightly different, right? Because of uh, the importance of the um, of agriculture in its export regime and the fact that China will remain a key buyer of these commodities. Um, and so there is a necessity now to, to politically balance um, that relationship, uh, maintain that relationship whilst ensuring that there is market diversification uh, moving forward. And, and as I think was already mentioned, um, today in today's world, you don't need a free trade agreement with China to be uh, to be trading uh, with China. That's proof. Uh, so well, it, and indeed, it yeah, I mean, UK's biggest bilateral trading relationship with the United States, and we famously or infamously don't have a trade deal with them. So you're right, it, but but nevertheless, trade deals can be can be a helpful supplement. So I, I wanted to try and finish. I, I said maybe we do an hour and a quarter or an hour and a half, but everyone's been so good that. I'm now worried that it might overrun an hour and a half. So um, uh, we should be respectful of the time of people listening. So let's let's bring it to some sort of brief closing remarks. Um, you know, state of play of Mercosur, uh, not just the EU trade deal, although that's obviously a, a very good indicator of the state of health of Mercosur, but um, your take on where we stand with Mercosur, and maybe, maybe I think, most interestingly, rather than looking backwards, is looking forwards. You know, what can what can we hope to see from Mercosur in in a realistic time, and not a big vision time scale in the next twenty years, but next two or three years? What what can Mercosur do that will be positive, maybe even transformational in the next two to three years? What are your hopes? And any other concluding thoughts here, just for you know a minute or two each to draw it to a close. Paolo, why don't we why don't we start with you? We'll go in reverse order of how people spoke at the beginning. So thank you, Jeremy. But for me, clearly in the next two, three years, I know you said already that you did, but that's that's what I would be working. That that for me would be not just for the EU, but as well as I try to explain for the for the success of Mercosur. A, a, an important, a, a, a key element. Uh, some uh, additional work will have to be done on um, on internal trade in Mercosur. As I said, the fact uh, that fundamentally the, the similar obstacles that other members of uh, other countries face in, in Mercosur are faced by the member of, of, of Mercosur and the fact that they cannot manage to uh, that the trade is not as uh, as, um, as 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 intense between them as it should be. Uh, there's 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 a way to, there's a way to go. Um, uh, that, in my view, is going to be the the main um, um, the main um, the, the main the main element that Mercosur will have to. Um, I, I would see for the next uh, uh, couple of years. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Georgina, your, your, your horizon scan for the next couple of years for Mercosur, what do you hope for? <laughs> um, good question. I mean, look, it's not for me to, to really comment on, on where Mercosur, um, Mercosur should be heading on, and reforming, but I, you know, what I would say is, is my hope is that we continue to deepen our, our relationships with, with Mercosur, um, and in the meantime, we continue to deepen those bilateral relationships um, as well with, with, with the member states. Thank you. Federico. Uh, as I said, uh, I, I, unfortunately, I think that Mercosur is in a gridlock and has been there for a long time. We need a uh, shock. I mean, uh, incremental reforms won't work. We try that for tens of years. It, it doesn't work. So I think that the, the hope is an, an external shock. Uh, I think that external shock could obviously be uh, the signature and entry into force of the 
Mercosur European Union trade agreement. Wait, 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 that, wait, 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 wait. You, you, you think the shock is, sorry, I'm interrupting your concluding remarks. Yep. That you're saying that Mercosur needs a sort of, or a shot in the arm, like a sort of, like a drug. And, 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 the, and the, the shot it needs is to conclude a deal with the EU that would suddenly... Yep, definitely. It will give a breath of air to Mercosur. It will encourage uh, uh, Uruguay, Paraguay, uh, countries that are needing to, to, to open uh, markets. Uh, it will also give us the institutional anchor and, and, and also, which is not a minor element, uh, in the moments in, in which Mercosur had a lot of progress, many of these moments were driven by external agenda. We, we were not able to manage our differences when we are discussing to eliminate the double collection of taxes or to having a protocol on government procurement. But whenever we, when we see progress and we see that we are going to give concessions to the European Union or Canada or whatever, which are more favorable than the ones that we have in Mercosur, then we go back to the internal regional table and we go ahead with our internal, internal agenda. So definitely this could be the shock that Mercosur needs. And for that you need political will and you need leadership. So is this election of Lula in Brazil and perhaps the change of government in Argentina in a couple of months, is that the window of opportunity that we need? I think it is. Yeah. And the question again is, is the European Union prepared to sign an agreement? Is Mercosur is prepared to sign the agreement? I, I think that's the big question. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Federico. And Emily, you, you. I have to agree with what Federico has said. I think that the big hope for Mercosur, and, and actually not only for Mercosur, for the EU as well, is to ratify this agreement. Let's not forget that the, the some of the last advances in that customs union came as a result of that negotiation, I'm thinking particularly in public procurement. And so the, the question now, if we're looking at a two to three year time frame, is how to get this done before the European parliamentary elections. So we are going to have to, uh, I mean, intensify uh, a lot of the, uh, the political relations uh, in order to push this uh, negotiation over the line. And if we're looking at now what that means, I think it's going to offer a chance for SMEs. And, and at the end of the day, SMEs really are uh, uh, fundamental to all of our economies. Um, and the opportunity for SMEs to integrate these, I wouldn't say global value chains, but maybe by regional value chains, thanks to eliminated tariffs, but also um, uh, ease in, in the rules that apply to them. Um, and, and so with that, I would say that, you know, once once you have that agreement in place, it offers opportunities using, and apologies for being a bit nerdy here, but using triangulation of origin to then seek to uh, finalize an agreement with Canada, with South Korea, um, and with uh, the UK. Um, or, and I'm sure that once uh, Irish whiskey, Georgina, um, can enter the, uh, the Brazil, the Brazilian market tariff-free, uh, there will be a lot of impetus for the UK to also conclude a, day, a deal. Gosh, yes. Um, okay, very good. No, that's good. Good point. Good point. Look, um, we've reached four o'clock. Uh, four o'clock. If you're sitting in the UK, we've reached the end of, of our planned session. Um, thank you so much, everybody. My experience is quite easy to put together a panel for a Zoom event, but it's quite difficult to put together a really good panel for a Zoom event. And uh, I think we actually do have not only a really good panel, the individual contributions, but a really well balanced panel because we got the Brazilian or perspective from Brazil, perspective from Argentinian outlook, crucially uh, the EU, the, the, the Brussels outlook, a um, bit of UK government, seeing Canning House is, is based here in London, so that's interesting and useful for us as well. Topical too, with Lula only having taken office this month, so it was a really good session. And thank you all very much, Emily, Georgina, Federico, Paolo, for your time. And on behalf of everybody who's been watching, thank you for your comments. I've tried to incorporate some of those observations and questions, weave them into our dialogue. Uh, I hope you've been interested by the answers, but also thank you everybody who's been watching for, um, for tuning in to Canning House and taking an interest in, in what we're doing in Latin America and this subject of future of Mercosur. Uh, we'll have lots more events at Canning House, some in person, some by Zoom. Um, the more people who participate, the more interest we can generate, the happier we are. But as for today, thank you all very much. Emily, Georgina, Federico, Paolo, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks a lot. Bye.
Goodbye to everyone. Thanks.